Are you possessed by your possessions? Or are you perturbed by your lack of possessions? If you find yourself in one of those two camps, James has a word for you this morning. I want us to think together about materialism, the Christian's relationship with possessions, how we ought to think about these issues. And we'll be encouraged to think through these things in the book of James chapter 1. So turn there with me, James chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse 9. When I started the week, my plan was to preach verses 9 through 18. As I began to study and write notes, it became obvious that was a little ambitious. So we're going to focus on verses 9 through 11 this morning. Three verses, but there's so much here. James chapter 1, verse 9. I want to ask you this morning if you are physically able to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm grateful today for my Bible. How about you? It's a lie. James chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. We are grateful that because of Jesus, we can... Come into your presence and be heard when we pray. We're grateful, Lord, that because of Jesus, we can have a daily, close walk with you. Lord, we're grateful for that wonderful truth and reality. It is good to know you. It's good to worship you. It's good to praise you. And it's good, Lord, to gather as a faith family and listen to you speak from your word. So, Lord, I pray that as we study your word, your spirit would move in our lives to open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see the truths of scripture and respond to those truths. Lord, we're grateful for our nation. We're grateful for the freedom that we enjoy and those that serve to defend and protect that freedom. But we're also mindful that there are some things happening in our nation that break our hearts. Troubling Laws being passed and things happening that, that are not of you. Lord, our nation needs the church to be the church. And so God, I pray that you would use this time of worship to help us to understand how our light can shine brighter. And we'll thank you and praise you for that grace. We love you, we exalt you, and we offer you this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, the end of our passage that we studied last week, we saw where James encourages those who are asking God for wisdom not to be double-minded. In other words, he encourages them not to have one, one foot In the things of God and one foot in the world, he says, when you ask God for wisdom, really desire that wisdom. Don't be double-minded. Literally, don't be double-souled. But before he gets back to the issue of trials in verse uh, 12, which he will, he wants to mention an issue that uh, is a particular area of temptation that we are often double-minded in. He mentions here possessions, material things, those who lack material things. He calls them the lowly. And those who have many possessions, he calls them 
rich. And James is addressing these two groups because he knows that if we don't get this issue right, we will be double-minded. We'll try to love God while loving money too. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't do that. You can't love God and stuff. The ESV Study Bible, when commenting on this passage in James, says, Both poverty and riches bring enormous pressure on a person to focus on the world rather than on Christ. And read that again. Both poverty and riches bring enormous pressure on a person to focus on the world rather than on Christ. So we think about possessions, money, stuff, material things. We are tempted to be double-minded. Trying to love God, but still one foot in the world, chasing after satisfaction in things. And that's not how it works. So James wants to address this to help us to think about how we should view and engage material possessions. And I've got four answers to the question. How are we to think about material things? How are we to think about material possessions? Number one. Rejoice, this is first, rejoice in your vast spiritual riches in Christ. Rejoice in your vast spiritual riches in Christ. Look what he says there in verse 9. Let the lowly brother, in context here, that speaks of someone who is uh, in poverty. The, it's the antithesis of being rich. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Now, what's he talking about there? Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. The exaltation is not societal because in the first century, if you did not have goods, if you did not have wealth, you were not elevated to a place of standing. You were often looked down upon and oppressed. So he's not talking about their exaltation in, in view of how others saw them. So what does he mean when he says... If you are lowly, boast in your exaltation. He's saying here, realize that in Christ you have great riches. You, you may not be much in the world's eyes, but you're a brother, he says. And if you're a brother in Christ, if you're saved, then you have been exalted spiritually speaking. You've been given great spiritual riches. So he says, you may not have much. But boast in your standing with God. Boast in the fact that you've been exalted by Christ. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. You've been indwelt by the Spirit of God. You have a relationship with Him. You're going to heaven when you die. Boast in that. You may not have much, but you have Jesus. So you have everything. That's what He's saying to those who are in poverty. Or those who uh, are maybe perturbed by their lack of possessions. In other words, finding our satisfaction and significance in Christ is an antidote to materialism. You say, wait, I don't want to be materialistic. I don't want to be possessed by possessions. I don't want to be perturbed when I don't have what I think I need to have. I, I, I don't want to live uh, tossed to and fro with a, a, a focus on things. How can I not be materialistic? This world encourages us to be. How can I uh, avoid materialism? Rejoice in your relationship with Christ. Remember, there's nothing this world offers you that is greater than your spiritual standing in Christ before God. There, there's nothing that this world offers you that's greater than being saved, right? So if you want to have an antidote to materialism in your life, find your satisfaction and significance in Christ. If you don't have what you want to have, if, if you're lacking in some things and you think those things will make you happy, stop thinking that they won't make you happy. Only Christ can satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. So just pursue Him. Walk with Him as we heard from the choir. Live for His glory. And that's where you'll find true satisfaction in life. Paul mentions this idea of spiritual riches in Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, He was in heaven, exalted in heaven, unceasing praise and worship there in heaven. Though He was rich, 
Yet for your sake he became poor. That means he left the splendor and glory of heaven. He took on humanity. He left unceasing worship to come to be mocked and maligned and mistreated by men. He took on humanity to come and die for our sins. He was rich, but he became poor for us, it says, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He's not talking about material riches. He's talking about riches in Christ. You might be saved and you might enjoy heaven one day because of what he came down to do for you. And so, number one, if you want to avoid being possessed by your possessions or perturbed by your lack of possessions, rejoice in Christ. He, he's the one, the only one, that will ultimately satisfy your soul. Stuff won't do it. Money won't do it. Material goods won't do it. Only Christ. So focus on him. I need you to pray for my youngest son, Connor. He's four. Here's what, what I need you to pray about. He doesn't like Chick-fil-A. We're not just talking about chicken. We're talking about Christian chicken. He doesn't like it. The only chicken he will eat are the most processed, frozen chicken nuggets you can buy. Tyson chicken nuggets, and he'll eat those if you make those, but that's the only ones he'll eat. He will not try a chicken nugget from Chick-fil-A. He doesn't know what he's missing, does he? He's over here dealing with, you know, frozen chicken nuggets. He could be eating Chick-fil-A. He has no idea what he's missing out on. And listen to me, if you think that your pursuit of, of stuff is going to satisfy, you're missing out on real satisfaction. You're missing out on the satisfaction that only Christ can give. So number one, as we think about our material goods, rejoice in your vast spiritual riches in Christ. Number two, this is important. Understand that life is short. Understand that life is short. Look what he says back in James, verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he, the rich person, will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers uh, the grass, its flower falls and his beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. What is James saying? He's saying our lives are transitory. Our lives on this earth are transitory. We, we are born, we grow and mature and develop, we reach maturity, we reach adulthood, and then we begin to decay. That'll bless you, won't it? And you begin to march towards your appointment with physical death. And everyone, listen to me, is a step closer to that than they were yesterday. Right? Life is short. When you spend all of your time focused on material things, you are acting as if you're going to be here forever. And you're not. Life is short, just like the, the grass. It, it grows and it looks great, but then because of the scorching sun or doesn't get what it needs, it withers and it dies. He's saying, don't get caught up in this world because this world, your life in this world, is very, very short. He says there uh, in verse 10, he says, the rich man, like a fly of the grass, will pass away. He will step out of this life into eternity, into the next life. You see, the brevity of life should never be far from our minds. The fact that we won't be here forever, the fact that this life is a vapor, it's just a, it's just a mist. We ought to think about that all the time because if we think about that all the time, then we'll seek to maximize this short life for the glory of God, right? But if you think you're going to live here forever, then you'll just spend your time trying to make this life more comfortable and more satisfying and it just never works out. Life is short. It's a vapor. 
The brevity of life should never be far from our minds. Since we have limited time on this earth, we should focus on what really matters. Listen to me. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. For anyone in this room, through the years as a pastor, I've had people say, Now, Pastor Wade, you've got to promise me when, um, when I die, you will do my funeral. I've had many people do that through the years. And I'll always say something like this. Well, I'm flattered that you would want me to be a part of that, and it would be an honor and a privilege for me, but here's what you need to understand. I could die before you do. Don't, don't count on the fact that, that Wade's going to still be around when you die. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Life is short, right? And if you live with that perspective, you have a wiser view of stuff of money, of material things. Understand that life is short, which leads to the third way we're to think about material possessions. Realize that your material possessions won't matter in eternity. Realize your your material possessions won't matter in eternity. Now James is going to step on our toes a little bit. You ready? He says there uh, in verse 11, The sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst, in the middle of his pursuits. So the picture here is of a rich man working, 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 trying to acquire more and and have more and possess more. And right in the middle of all of that effort and focus, he's gone. And his stuff doesn't go with him. That's what the Bible says. It says it clearly over in Psalm 49, verses 16 and 17. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, listen to this, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. You've heard the, the phrase, you don't see hearses hooked up behind, I mean, chair, uh, U-Hauls hooked up behind hearses, do you? You don't see that. Ancient Egypt... They, they, would, they would bury their kings and important people with all of their material goods so they could use them in the afterlife. Well, guess what? Archaeologists have found those kings and some of those folks that were buried, and guess what? Their material things were still there. They weren't enjoying them in the afterlife. You, you cannot take your material goods with you in heaven. They won't matter in eternity. Now, let me be clear. It's not a sin to be wealthy. God blesses people in different ways. And I've seen people with great resources use those resources and leverage those resources for the kingdom of God. And it's a beautiful thing to see. It's not not wrong to be wealthy. not a sin to be wealthy. It's not a sin to work hard and apply yourself and be diligent. The Bible tells us we ought to work hard and and, and be dependable and, and, and thrifty and wise. There's nothing wrong with that. But just understand that what you acquire on this earth is not going to matter when you get into eternity. So here's the question. What will matter? When when we step out of this life into the next, what's going to matter? What's going to matter in eternity? Two questions that will matter in eternity. You ready? Number one, are you saved? That's going to matter in eternity. Are you saved? Jesus illustrates this with a very powerful parable. Uh, Hold your place, but turn to Luke chapter 12 with me. Luke chapter 12. I'm going to show you this parable that Jesus shares to drive this point home. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And so they come and say, Hey, it's time for inheritance. We want to make sure this is done right. And so make sure that this is done right. We want our share and all of that. I've seen families through the years ruined by desire for stuff when a loved one dies. I preached a funeral one time and 
the lady there, uh, one of the family members invited me to the home to, you know, have a, a bite to eat with the family, and she was really encouraging me to go to the, the house, and so I did, and, and, I, and I went to the house, and it was clear when I got there, I was there to mediate between two rival factions wanting their parents' money. I was like, I'm not a mediator, and I got out of there, but but, but that's, that's what happens. People get so, so bent on more stuff. They come to Jesus and say, uh, Jesus, what, what should we do with, with, with the, the inheritance? I, I want the inheritance. And look what Jesus said. He said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus said the same thing. I'm not a mediator. He said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced uh, plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, watch this, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus says, if you are busy about the things of this world and you have not attended to your soul, you are a fool. Because you cannot take your stuff with you. You spend all of this time accumulating and earning and saving and investing and to get the right level in your 401k or the right house or the right vehicles or the right school for your children. You do all this work. But then you die and you stand before the judge and you're not saved. What a wasted life. That's what Jesus is saying here. You accumulate, but you don't deal with your soul. So what's going to matter when you get to heaven? Are you saved? That's question number one. And and let me just remind you, there's only one way to be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We're all sinners separated from God. But Jesus loves us, came to this earth, died on the cross in our place. He took the punishment we deserve. And after he died on the cross, he was buried. And early on the third day, he rose from the grave. He's alive today. He'll save anyone who put their trust and faith in him alone. He's the way to be saved. If you're focused on stuff, and you've never embraced Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let me plead with you today. Focus on what's going to matter in eternity. Deal with your soul today. Second question. Did you store up riches in heaven by living a faithful life? When you get to eternity, that's what's going to matter. Not how much money you had, but did you store up riches in heaven by living a faithful life? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, Invest in the kingdom. Live for the glory of God, and when you get to heaven, there'll be treasures in heaven, spiritual treasures, and you'll be glad that they are there. Paul addresses the same issue in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 through 19, when he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now listen to what he says to the rich. And by the way, let me just say this. Based upon uh, the world's population, compared to about 75% of the world, everyone in this room is rich. Everyone. He says, they are to do good. To be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Jesus and Paul say, use your material goods to invest in things that matter. So when you get to heaven, there'll be treasure there for you to enjoy. 
there was a movement years ago. There was a movie that came out by this name. and The movement was called Pay It Forward. And the idea was when someone does something kind for you, instead of trying to repay them, you just be kind to someone else. Someone helps you in a certain way, then you help someone else. And you, and you pay that good deed forward. You pay that kindness forward. And that, that's a good concept. That's a helpful concept. But can I suggest to you that we need to focus on paying it forward eternally? We need to use and leverage our resources for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. So that when we get to heaven, we'll see how God used our lives and our resources to impact this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pay it forward. Pay it into eternity. So when you get to heaven, or when you get to eternity, two questions are going to matter. Are you saved, and did you store up riches in heaven by living a faithful life? Realize that your material possessions won't matter in eternity. But there's a fourth reality here, and we'll be through. How are we to think about material possessions? Rejoice in your vast spiritual riches in Christ. Understand that life is short. Realize that your material possessions won't matter in eternity. But fourth and last, conclude that the world will never embrace an ardent follower of Christ. Conclude that the world will never embrace an ardent follower of Christ. And look what it says back in James chapter 1. Verse 10. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Now what's that mean? That the rich should boast in their humiliation. What is that talking about? Well, I believe he's talking to Christians here. Christians who are lacking in possessions and Christians who have much wealth. And he's saying... The, the poor man, the, the one in poverty, can rejoice and boast in their spiritual exaltation. Their say, they have riches in Christ. The rich man can boast in his humiliation. Meaning that if this person or these people he's talking to, if they live fervently for Jesus they may lose their social standing. Even though they're rich, even though they have many of the world's goods, when they begin to really get serious about Jesus, the world is going to begin to sneer and mock and marginalize. That's what he's saying. He's saying to the rich, if you are a faithful fervent follower of Christ. You, listen, you're never going to fit in. No matter how much stuff you have, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how much you've achieved, you're never going to fit in. You're different. You're an alien. You're a Christian. Your values are countercultural to the ways of this world. You're never going to fit in. And so conclude this, no matter what you achieve, no matter what you acquire, if you love Jesus, the world is not going to like you. So stop trying to live for the world's applause. In fact, live for Jesus, not anyone else's applause. Live for an audience of one Paul said it like this, anyone who desires to live godly, poor, rich, anyone, anyone who desires to live godly will be persecuted. That's what the Bible says. He said, well, I'm very important. I've got a lot on the line. I've acquired a lot. I've achieved a lot. You love Jesus, the world's not going to like it. So, don't get caught up in your stuff. Boast in your humiliation. The world may think I'm foolish, but 
I live for an audience of one. That's what Paul is saying the wealthy person's posture should be. Douglas Moo writes this, If the one who is rich is a Christian, then James' encouragement to that person to take pride in his low position will mean that the rich believer is to boast not in his wealth or his elevated social position, but in his identification with Christ and his people, a matter of humiliation in the eyes of the world. Some of you in this room know this to be true. You've achieved a lot, you've acquired a lot, but you live countercultural because you're a Christian. You have different values in this world. And, and, and some of you businessmen have, or businesswomen, you felt the sneer when you wouldn't cheat on your expense report the way other people did. Or you didn't manipulate your taxes the way other people did. You did the right thing, living for Jesus with integrity, and other folks didn't like it. But we're not here to impress other folks, amen? We're here to let our light shine and point them to Jesus. We're here to live for an audience of one. We're here to live for the glory of God. So just understand, just understand, Christian, you're never going to fit in. So stop trying. Live boldly for Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you say, I'm possessed my, by my possessions, James has a word for you. If you're here and you say, I'm perturbed by my lack of possessions, James has a word for you. More important than anything we possess or own, is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ.